are now in the time of the greatest national crisis. The utmost has been done by our peace-loving king and statesman to avert war, but we've been thwarted and war has been thrust upon us. It's furthered my knowledge of what involvement my family had, because many of them served in the army, and you're always seeking to gain more knowledge of what took place a hundred years ago. It is almost an impossibility that Britain could stand aside and she will never make a move or stand. This project's about finding out more. I know a bit about my grandfather. I know even more now, but I also know how he fits in to the bigger picture. And that, for me, is fascinating. All is now at stake for our country and all are called upon to support her. 100 years since the bus train crash in British railway history. When a group of mostly Leithers who trained here, drilled here in 1915, their train crashed near Gretna and 216 of them died. And trying to imagine the position that these young men were put in is, is, is horrendous. It just kind of commemorates the men's lives that were lost in Leith. The hour of our nation's destiny has come, and the point has been reached where every able-bodied man between 18 and 35 should no longer ask themselves, should I go, but must indeed ask. There I stay. The Gretna 100 project at its heart is a social history project and for me what it's about is looking at Leith, looking at this community, looking at what it's like now, what it was like 100 years ago and the effect that this crash had on this community and who these people were that died in this crash not just in terms of their soldiers or their military record, but where they lived in Leith, who they lived with in their family, who their brothers and sisters were, what their mums and dads did for a living, how they might have been affected by the news of that crash. I think that's actually very important because in a way there are other things happening marking the centenary. But what's happening here is very much focused on the place. It's something that could, could only be done here. There's lots of stuff around the military things which the Royal Scots are doing very well. So this was something separate to that. This was a social history project about this community, about this area and the effect that this crash had on this area. We wanted it to be looking at the events and thinking about all the different aspects and, and fundamentally focusing on what it meant to the families and individuals who were, who were left behind and the, and the community as a whole. And one of the most important things for us that it wasn't, you know, it was bringing in different perspectives and it was looking at Leith at that time and not just a, a kind of stereotype version of what the community might have been as it prepared for war. So Gretna 100 encompasses a few different parts really. One of the main parts was a research group to collect some stories and images, to think about Leith at the time, to think about what these streets would have been like at the time, a little bit about the crash, but actually most of the focus wasn't on the crash and the specifics of the crash. It was more about who these people were, who they lived with, what kind of conditions they lived, what they would have seen in Leith every day, what it would have been like going on a train up to Laba, all of this kind of stuff. So what's been fantastic about this project is actually working in the building where uh, the troops used to muster and to, uh, to train. And we had access to William Begbie's diary, which describes the buglers running around Leith calling for people to stop work, go home, get changed, and to report to their drill hall. And obviously this was the drill hall of the 1st, 7th, the Royal Scots. And we collected this into a big file and this file then became 
the starting point for a devising process for a piece of theatre. And this piece of theatre was a collaboration between Active Inquiries flashback drama that I run here and also Strange Town Young Company. So we collaborated and came together and finally had a cast of 22, so it was a big group. And from that, working with the writer Duncan Kidd and also writer Paul Hughes, we developed this piece of theatre. And it really just started from small improvisations and thoughts coming from that. And then we quickly developed the idea that we would like to tell a story of five characters and that these five characters would be people left behind in Leith. That actually the soldiers wouldn't be the main characters, it would be the people left behind. So we really wanted to tell the story of the people who were affected by it, the, the local community, the families and all the people involved who'd probably not had their story told before. Again, we started to identify these five characters and develop them through other rehearsals and improvisations, who their families were, how they lived, how they felt about the crash, how they were connected to one of the soldiers. So all of that stuff went through the devising process and then over the Christmas period we worked on writing it, again with uh, I helped a little bit but it was mostly Duncan, Kidd and Paul Hughes that did that. We were looking at the five strands of emotion that people experience during a tragedy that there's been research into, for instance, there's disbelief and anger and grief and an acceptance, the kind of carrying on, persevering no matter what, which is, you know, the name of the play and the motto of Leith. So the process of the play is the relationships of the soldiers that crashed to the people who've been left behind and the play shows sort of their reaction to those crashes. And we follow the five characters the audience has to choose which stories it wants to follow. And there are three scenes for each of the five characters and they are broken up by main scenes which everyone is involved in. So people don't get to see everything, which is a real life scenario. They hear other things in the background. They can follow characters through their three scenes or mix it up a bit more. And, and try and see all five characters in some of their scenes. We wanted to make sure in the small spaces that we used that people really felt that they were in a front room of a tenement flat in Leith. They were in a classroom, they were in the soldier's office, you know, rather than, rather than kind of feeling they were just on the outside of it. I think performing in this space was crucial to the story because the, the history of the building and the relationship of the building to the crash has been forgotten by a lot of people and the fact that over 100 bodies from the crash were brought to this building and laid out on the floor out there for the families to come and identify and in some cases struggle to identify because they've been so badly burned just makes it an amazing opportunity to, to perform in the actual space. There was an evening when I was rehearsing with the the soldiers who receive a call to, to tell them about the crash and we all had a kind of shiver down our spines thinking that actually that call did actually happen in this building. Gentlemen, I have some very great news. This was a community project from the very beginning so that's why Rob and Out of the Blue approached Active Inquiry in Strange Towns with two community companies based here out of the blue to be involved. It wasn't about being a professional production in terms of employing professional actors, that is. And that's because a lot of the people live in Leith, they have a strong connection to this building, and so I think that it's really important that they were the ones telling the story. Obviously, this is a play to commemorate 100 years since the Great Train disaster, but what I like about <clears throat> what we're doing with the story and the characters is that it's not like we feature the crash, but really we're following the stories of the people at the time and the people in Leith and like what their lives were like and all the different possible situations that all these characters could be in and how, that, how, how the crash affected them in many different ways considering their background. For me it's also taught me a lot about like Leith back in the day um, and how the people were and how they dressed mm. um, as well as what World War I was like because I'm mostly new about World War II from yeah. what you hear in at history at school um, and I never knew about the, the train disaster or anything like that so I know a lot you know I know all about it now yeah. um, and it's it, you know acting it as I say before it's real it's happened so it makes it a bit tougher to try and go in there and, and show the emotion of, of the time. I think it's it's really important to do things like this because even though the Gretna train disaster was a hundred years ago, completely different time, we can't forget events like that. It certainly shook the community. 
you know, to its core. I thought it was great that it, it didn't just concentrate on the soldiers because obviously there's a, you know, there's so much of, uh, around at the, at the moment about the First World War, etc. And there is a tendency to um, concentrate on the, on the, on the soldiers. Um, and there's, you know, an opportunity to actually follow some stories of individuals and to show what might have been going on in the schools and to show the, you know, some of the facts that it wasn't all gung-ho, let's all go to war. There were many people who were resisting that and to see some of those historical facts come out in a, in a performance within the draw hall had a lot of power for me. I will be holding a committee meeting here for the anti-war league on Saturday evening and I think it would be useful if some of you were to attend. You might even learn something. The drill hall for me was really central to this story. Firstly, it was the place where these young men trained, where they drilled. So it was a real part of this community and it's what really drew people towards it. So there was hundreds of people that would drill here. Squad, on the right, quick march, left. From my perspective, I don't know when the last time anyone's done drill in the drill hall in here in Leith. Um, so to be the person shouting out drill in the drill hall, that's probably been uh, unused for anything like that for years and years and years, is pretty cool. Kind of thinking back about the people that will have walked about the halls and what the building would have been like back then and what would the people who used this building in the past, what would they think about how it's being used today and if they'd be into it or not. And Knowing that all of these people, a lot of these people were from Leith and that their bodies were brought back and put in the drill hall and now we're walking about there making a play about that. It's pretty crazy. I think it's great. It makes you really makes you think about the past and what bearing it has in today. Really interesting. So it's where they trained, it's where they marched out of on the 1st of May 1915 to go down to get the train up to near Falkirk for their training. Then, of course, it became the focus point. It became the focus point for families who were looking for information. They didn't have internet or anything like that. Of course, there was newspapers and lots of little newspapers up and down Leith Walk. But it's the place where people came looking for information. There's a, a famous photo, actually, of families gathered outside this drill hall looking for information. Because it must have been dreadful for the wives and the mothers waiting outside the drill hall, waiting to hear who was alive and who was lost. You know, in this day and age where we have counselling and therapy for things, that, that, that you know, the, the people heard about it and they came to the drill hall and there is a story, whether it's true or not, that, that the, the first floor window was pulled up and heads stuck out and somebody read out a list of names and they shut the window. And that was it. Alan, Robert, Private, Missing. And then thirdly, it became the part where the coffins were brought here. So this was the place where coffins were brought and laid out so that family members could come and try and identify some of the dead bodies and most of that time it was by little good luck charms, little metal things that hadn't burnt in the fire. Of course it was very difficult to identify bodies which is why so many were buried in a, in a mass grave in the end. When I was first brought in uh, to the project, the research group had already spent three months uh, piling a huge file of information and stories from descendants and from archives. And they wanted to know how to turn this big file into a visual exhibition. One of my thoughts was, as it's the first 7th Battalion, that we should choose seven of the men, which would show a cross-section of the battalion. Exhibitions, although they're visual in a lot of ways, are also about narrative and the story of Gretna. It, it's a railway disaster, but you know there was a lot of other people looking at that. Really, we wanted to try and find out what the impact was within the local community and how we could tell that story as residents, as people living in the same place, and as people with an interest in how history informs contemporary identity. And we actually felt it would be quite nice to concentrate on seven of the 
soldiers because although the play did look at some of the soldiers, they were fictional. We decided very early on in the play that we were going to do fictional stories that were based on real stories and were amalgamations of real stories, but we didn't actually have real soldiers' experiences in there because that would have been very tricky to do. So actually we thought it would be nice in the exhibition to have real soldiers and what their stories were. Robert Rennick, 1378. Alexander Thompson. Robert Hill Say, 1388. Archibald Simpson, 1150. John Williamson Ballantyne. Peter Cumming, Regimental Number 1626. Lieutenant Noel Graham Salveson, September 1923. One of my passions as a curator uh, and as an artist is to get communities to tell their own story in their own words. And this has been a fantastic opportunity to do that because the seven researchers have chosen seven men and told their story. The people on the committee have been so enthusiastic in, in finding the facts for this exhibition. It's been a real eye-opener to me and it's been a pleasure to have been a small part of it. Survived the first crash, went back to get his hat and didn't survive the second crash, 57 seconds later. The challenge to the research group was for them to write their own interpretation panel. And so to learn how to tell a story succinctly in about 150 words. And some chose to do that in prose, some chose to do that in forms of a poem and some wrote a, a letter. Dear Ernest, I hope this letter finds you well. I know we will meet next week at your wedding, but that will be such a happy and busy occasion and I wanted to share some more sober thoughts first. Well, it's been interesting because I love learning anyway. I've lived in Leith and I've learned so much about Leith, which is the kind of knowledge you get when you, you, you're brought up somewhere and I was brought up in Glasgow. So I didn't have it about Leith and it was fascinating to learn what a vibrant and interesting place it was at the turn of, of the last century. Only 62 men answered the roll call. Alexander Thompson was one. His mother had lived in Leith as a girl and joining the 1st 7th Battalion was like coming home. When asked if he would serve overseas, he agreed. Only 17 years old. There's been such an interesting group of people and it's been a joy to actually meet up with them, people who are interested in the same subject. And I've really enjoyed the process of taking lots and lots of information and getting down to the essence of what we feel the story is. And that's been a fascinating thing to see. Part of a small band of men, he set to work helping their injured comrades amongst the heat of the fires and the acrid smoke in the air. I was detailed for stretcher duties. I wept. I have witnessed many battlefields since, but never again experienced what I saw that fateful day. So having chosen seven of the seventh, three died and four survived, we are zigzagging a course between luck and fate in that if you were lucky enough to survive, what was your fate at Gallipoli? Gallipoli was a very, very desperate campaign in some ways in terms of the heat, the dust, the flies and the equipment. As we know from, from Heather, her grandfather survived but many didn't and by the time the survivors who had been given two weeks leave got to Gallipoli in August there was very little of their regiment left. So the gentlemen on the other train sadly had lost their lives at the Battle of Akibaba at Gully Ravine in the months in between. When you're working in what might be considered quite difficult spaces, like some areas of the drill hall, there's so much other stuff going on. It's a very busy visual environment. So really there's a couple of options that you've got. Attaching to walls really isn't a, a, a practical solution because then they come down, you're left with holes. So you can either work within kind of little units or you can think about flexible screens that then kind of break the space up and allow you to put um, work onto that. The Matchbox though were a fantastic solution, I think, in the end. The boards are laser etched. They are burnt 
into wood and that was part of our theme in that the fire travelled up the train faster than a man could walk. And also because the Leith Burg, the council, had wanted to send the boys off with a, a gift and had had a council meeting the week before they left on the 1st of May to decide what to give them. And one thought was a, a lighter with uh, the crest engraved on it. Whether they managed that or not, we don't know because actually we've never found a lighter or a picture of one. However, we have found an article in the newspaper saying that they were all given a packet of cigarettes and a packet of loose for matches. But at the council meeting, one council equipped, they could be known if they had the lighters as the matchless seventh. A bit of an equivalent to the dandy ninth, which is a popular moniker. One of the legacies of the exhibition is also that local people are hearing about the commemorations and bringing in items which we've never seen before. So here we have a copy of the Daily Sketch from Wednesday the 26th of May showing the first photographs of the funeral cortege. The widow's grief in the town of sorrow is the headline and the wail of bagpipes at the train victim's funeral. So this headline links in so brilliantly with Robert Rennick's story. Jim's great uncle Robert was one of the missing, the 50 of whom there was no trace found. And his, his mum, Ellen Rennick, had seven sons in the forces. And of those seven boys who were fighting, by the end of the war, only one had died. And that was Robert who died at the Gretna. I am waiting, Whitson weekend. The draw hall door is closed. A dirty window opens above. A list is read. A widow screams. A crowd leaves down many street. I am remembering. Three weeks ago, the door was open. The pride of Leith marched out. And there were about 50 men who were termed missing. And looking in the Leith Library and in the archive at Central Library here in Edinburgh, if you look through the microfiches of the papers, weeks and weeks later, there are still wives and mothers asking for information of someone who is missing, because basically there was nothing left of them. It must have been just dreadful, not even to have closure of being able to bury your son or your brother or your father. And then a big part of this exhibition as well was a, a piece called The Tree of Life. The Tree of Life were done in partnership with Thilmeny Youth Centre and artist Heather Scott and she was working with young people at Leith Academy and at Thilmeny Youth Centre to create a glass dog tag which had the name and age of every soldier who died. So that became a big part of that exhibition as well. It was Brian Mohan from Thilmeny Youth Centre that uh, got in touch with me to ask if I could create a memorial for the Gretna Centenary coming up. So we did a bit of a brainstorming session because Brian really wanted to, to create something that got the men's uh, identities across to the local community to make them aware of the history of the Leith Battalion because for a lot of Leithers they weren't aware of it. Like myself, I've grown up in Leith, I didn't know about the Gretna rail crash and the devastating effect within the community at the time. What really got to me was that apart from the memorial at Rosebank Cemetery at Polrig, there was basically nothing else. While researching one night, I managed to find a site that gave the names and addresses of the 216 casualties, plus a list of injured. And lo and behold, there was a name, Daniel McNamara. His address is the address where I stay now. And I think that was the thing that, that I sort of thought to myself, wow, you know, that guy walked the same pavement as me, saw the same views as me, because nothing has changed here. The tenements are still here that, that were built in Daniel's day back in, 19, in the early 1900s. So that was the thing that gave me the, the first push. Gavin came round, we had a discussion, and I mentioned the tree of life, and the thing kind of evolved from there. Lovely, perfect. 
again, in order to show the individual men's names, thinking along the lines of military, that sort of thought off dog tags. And when I did a bit of research, it was ID discs that Britain were just developing during First World War. So I thought that would be ideal, having the 216 discs displaying each individual man. The bluebells that, that were finally added were tribute to the relatives and loved ones left behind because I found them reminiscent to the Flowers of the Forest, the old Scots song, with young men being lost at war. And the tragic thing and that the men weren't at war but on their way to war, but sure to die anyway if they had carried on their journey. I feel it was important getting the different youth groups involved as part of the bigger picture of bringing the history back to Leith. Out of the blue, I liked the idea and they would have been happy to site the finished tree at the drill hall, which was the headquarters for the 7th Battalion. I think it was important to have a lasting memorial within the, the drill hall as being used as a community centre, an arts centre, but I think it's fitting that they should be remembered in the place that they all used to gather. So it's a lovely exhibition and the beauty about it is it's quite easily movable so it can move when that space is needed but, but it can also be, be put back again so that hopefully that really becomes a kind of semi-permanent thing to connect the drill hall with the crash. I think there's some real value in what Out of the Blue and what Gretna 100 has started to do and I think that is to talk about the history of this place, not just the history of Edinburgh or the history of Scotland, although I think all those things are reflected in that, but I think the history of this street, the, the, the almost the hyper-local nature of that I think is incredible. I'm really hoping that those involved, there are a lot of people involved, will continue to get involved in arts projects in the future and if we've, if we've managed to achieve that, I think that's been a huge success for the project. I think it's important to record these things and, and bring, it, bring it home so that there's permanent reminders of the tragedy of, of, of war and how local communities are affected by it, but just history in general, definitely to make it more tangible for kids for learning. The connection with the building, you know, the drill hall, where the play was being shown, where the exhibition was, and it's these walls, this ceiling, this floor. This structure is the same structure from a hundred years ago. This is where the events of the aftermath happened. All the readings I'd made from newspapers of the coffins and the potted plums and the prayers being said, it was where we were. And that connection was profound and very, very emotional. And I, I spoke to other people afterwards who felt the same.